Welcome back to the Northern Sentinels podcast. I'm your host, editor, and producer, Chris Ayotte. On this episode, I sit down with Tim Powers in the offices of Summa Strategies in downtown Ottawa. I met Tim through a mutual friend in 2017 after mentioning how this guy named Tim Powers was one of my favorite panelists on power and politics. So when I was looking for someone to talk politics in these turbulent times, he was at the top of my list. We also dive into a bit of Newfoundland history, mental health, rugby, and fatherhood. Before we get to our guest, a quick word from our podcast partner, The Digital Insurgency, a veteran-owned business that helps complex organizations collaborate better. Ever thought driving innovation in this bureaucracy is impossible? I'm the only one trying. The answer, you're not the only one. There are people like you in every bureaucracy around the world working your problems. Doesn't matter if it's the state government of California or the federal department in Canada, we've interviewed them all. Don't go to events with hundreds of people wondering, who should I talk to? Instead, find the three to five people that can really help. At the Digital Insurgency, we use software to connect the right person at the right time for all the right conversations. We help complex organizations collaborate better. We build better connections. And now my friends, here's my conversation with Tim Powers. Tim, welcome to the show. Chris, good to be here. You're doing great work with this, by the way. Congratulations. Thanks. I appreciate you, you reciprocating. It was awesome being on your uh, your show and, uh, and nice to have you on the podcast. Uh, speaking of your show, family, mm-hmm. Newfoundland, proud Newfoundlander, uh, I'd like to learn a little bit more about um, where the two sides of your family <laughs> come from and, uh, and sort of life growing up in Newfoundland. Well, Chris, we could go all the way back because family legend has it we're somehow connected to Robert the Bruce in Scotland. Really? So you will know this, but if you've watched Braveheart, yeah. we're not the Mel Gibson character. We're the <laughs> other guy. We're Robert the Bruce, and uh, uh, that's my mother's family. So we were pirates and land marauders, apparently. Terrible, terrible lot. And, and fast forward, now we're just really nice, calm, docile people <laughs> like the rest of Canada. But my mother's originally from Newfoundland and Labrador. My father, who is from the... Um, from British Columbia came to Newfoundland for that great nation building project called the Trans Canada Highway. So uh, okay. after Newfoundland joined Canada, a little bit after, he was with a well known Canadian company at the time called McDamara. And they met there and settled there. And my mum's family has a long political, cultural history in Newfoundland. One of my one great-grandfather was the prime minister of Newfoundland, uh, while the other great-grandfather was the finance minister of Newfoundland. It was a small place, let's not kid ourselves. Uh, not that we were splendid or anything like that. And, uh, uh, and our families were also very involved in the Confederation debate in the uh, 40s. Uh, one great-uncle um, proposing to join the United States. So I've been cursed and connected with <laughs> politics and culture and all that is Newfoundland for a very long time. Now, I think we'll, we'll talk a, a fair bit about Newfoundland, but so I, your father's side in BC, where was he from in British Columbia? Uh, up in a place called um, Ainsworth, which is a mining town uh, up in northern BC. And he, because they were, weren't were very uh, well off in the day, my, my great-grandfather was a First World War veteran, uh, and they, they had struggled financially to raise family, uh, to pay for all their families. So my dad grew up with his grandmother, my great-grandmother in Ainsworth, until he was about 10, and then... Uh, then came out to Ottawa and was here was here as we're recording in Ottawa and then went to BC and then Newfoundland so been uh, he was a bit of a wanderer till he got to Newfoundland and Labrador and settled as I say became a long time builder very involved in, in what you're interested in in terms of your personal history for years he was one of the main contractors for CFB Goose Bay uh, Is he really? Yeah, okay. uh, during the whole low-level flying debate when it was a, yeah. a, a discussed, well, it was a NATO training center. He, his business was there for thirty or forty years. Um, at the, he built the German Air Force hangar for them there, 
did a lot of work for the Brits and the Canadians. So we also have this interesting overlap with with military history or connections. His mm. brother was um, was a Cameron Highlander from here in Ottawa, fought in the Second World War, though none of our immediate family were in the military. Um, a lot of our uh, extended family were. The the Goose Bay thing is, is interesting. Um, people who haven't been there, it's really hard to describe. It is. Uh, this small community in Labrador and the, 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 the base is massive. A massive amount of infrastructure because there was a number of uh, allied nations mm-hmm. that set up permanent footprints there. And still to this day, because uh, I, I was there not too long ago, but you see these barracks that have a, a German flag, a British flag, an American flag on them, and are sort of still uh, heat and lights are kept on and maintained for that. So, oh, that's really uh, that's really interesting. And of course, the the um, the space shuttle has landed there right. a couple of times, been carried there by the U.S. Air Force. Gander gets all the attention around 9/11, but on 9/11, a number of aircraft also uh, sought refuge in in Goose Bay. Uh, on that terrible day. Uh, And uh, many interesting dignitaries have passed through there over the years because it was one, as as your military historians who are listening will know, it was one of the five bases in the land-lease deal that the the Americans and the British did in 1941 to get the Americans in there. And it's probably the most strategically significant, or at least was for a while, uh, what, northeastern base in Mm. Canada. Was Argentia part of that land lease deal? It was Argentia, okay. Stephenville, Gander, Goose Bay, and Fort Pepperell in St. John's. Okay. I think that's five. Yeah, that's five. Right mm-hmm. on. Um, now, were you born and raised in St. John's? Not in 1941. Uh, <laughs> I, I was born and raised in, uh, in St. John's. Yes, I was. Grew up there uh, and was educated there for quite a while. So what did you, what did you spend your time doing as a kid? Now, Chris, this is a public recording. I can't tell you that. I'll get thrown in jail. Um, Mostly doing good things with some people you know. uh, That's right. And and others. Um, Pretty average childhood, pretty lucky childhood. Uh, You know, sports, um, a lot of community stuff. Both my parents were big volunteers. My mother ran the Newfoundland Labrador SPCA for a very long period of time. but we had a very good life. We were educated by Christian brothers, the same ones got themselves in trouble. But nonetheless, the education was good. Um, big extended family on my mother's side that were there, very tight. You know, all those kind of Newfoundland sinew and roots that you hear so much about were implanted at that age. So while I may be a Canadian and a proud Canadian, I'm also a Newfoundlander and Labradorian. Mm. Yeah, it's... Uh that sense of community, I think, is uh, is so important, and one of the things that I really feel gets eroded in the digital age is that you don't have that, uh, you don't have those those connections like we used to, because you just send a text instead of picking up the phone, or you know you. Well, your your point's a really good one because this takes us back to COVID. Takes us back. It's not been that long ago, but I think we're all glad that. The worst part of it's in the rearview mirror, but Newfoundland and Labrador, along with Atlantic Canada, was in a bubble, meaning you could only travel within the Atlantic region, which was really irritating to to me and a number of others who live in Ontario or or elsewhere in the country and couldn't get home. But what was fascinating was that sense of community was not really that interrupted because there weren't that many gathering limit restrictions like there were in other jurisdictions. So I look at the mental health and well-being of uh, my mother and her friends, and it was much better, I think, than you know, comparative seniors in different jurisdictions because they could still interact. I mean, ours is a house, as many Newfoundland homes are this way, where people still drop in. You don't make an appointment, you just do it. You know, you could pop in at any moment and there are five or six cousins having a meal and and a yarn, and that's pretty common and refreshing, at least in Newfoundland and Labrador. It hasn't been um, destroyed by the intermediation of technology. Hmm. Still, it's still there to this day. I was talking to my... So we're recording on a Monday. I was talking to my mother on a Sunday, and she'd had 10 people for breakfast on the Saturday, awesome. and that's not unusual. Maybe we'll, we'll skip ahead and then skip back, but 
So when you when you left Newfoundland and you you know you came uh, you came out to Ottawa, you, mm-hmm. you came to Ontario. Did you did you miss that? Did you still have that sort of um, that sort of baked into the DNA of wanting to drop by, and it is, other people find it strange. Like, how did you did you manage that kind of cultural transition? Well, it was always funny. First of all, because Newfoundlanders, we think we're the most friendly people, and try and <laughs> strike up. You're different as an Ontarian, but uh, try and strike up a random conversation with an Ontarian. They're yes. not sure if you're going to roll them for their wallet, yeah. or they look at you as if you may have just been on some sort of release program. So it was a little different at first, but in places like Ottawa, there are a lot of Atlantic. Canadians and, and Newfoundlanders, and you, you, they find each other. We still keep our communities, much like the military. Um, yeah. You know, you'll find people who are from where you're from or share your collective interests. And uh, sport was a great connector for me that way. I actually came to Toronto first or Oakville. I went to a, a boarding school. That was kind of a failed experiment, but because uh, <laughs> I, I really wanted to go back to Newfoundland at the time. But uh, yeah, it's uh, my sister now lives here, so we're, we're kind of lucky. We've got a good Newfoundland connection and community here. You just mentioned sport, mm. um, and I know you're you're an avid rugby player, avid rugby supporter. At uh, what point did you get into to rugby as a kid? Actually, that was an Ontario gift. When I came to really? Ontario, when, you know, I suppose Ontario's given me a few things, uh, a good life, but being, I suppose that's the most important. Um, but yeah, when I came to Ontario, I started playing rugby and then picked it up there, went home to Newfoundland to university and did all right with it. And then uh, came back here, played a little bit again. And in the strange twist of fate, ended up running the uh, the rugby organization, became the president of Rugby Canada uh, less than a decade ago. What about rugby drew you to it? What did you like about it? Again, I I think I make the connection to the military. It's the fraternity, the tradition. Um, The game itself has lots of examples of life. It has moments of joy. It has moments of adversity. It has moments of brotherhood. It has uh, moments of of uh, of of physical toughness um, so it was all of that and the community again I'll go back I'm a big community person the community of people in the business I'm part of SUMA or one of the businesses I'm part of you know uh, two of the three of the original four partners were all rugby players so it's again that kind of fraternity sense of belonging shared values all of those things and I found that in in rugby, and I, I sit here as a proud uncle because very shortly my niece uh, will be playing rugby for Canada in Wales. Awesome. She's going over as part of our Canadian U20 team, so it's kind of nice to see. What's her name? Her name is Sarah Schoenfeld. She goes to, uh, don't hold this against her, our MC listeners. She goes to <laughs> Queens. <laughs> They're pretty good at rugby. Um, but she uh, she's going over uh, in July. Good for her. Congratulations. Uh, so you you picked up rugby in Ontario. How was how were you at school? What did you think of school as a kid? <laughs> <laughs> I did pretty. I did okay. I, look, um, when you were at school, the, the, you know, again, despite all of the challenges the Christian Brothers organization had in Newfoundland and Labrador, they did do some good um, in terms of educators. They were very good educators, and you know, they were educated at places like. Uh, Loyola or Notre Dame, so they were well, uh, well knowledgeable um, and good teachers, and so I, I did, you know, reasonably well at school, um, and really liked history, really liked more of the arts, and that I guess shaped some of who I am today. Wasn't a big fan of uh, of math and science, but uh, trudged through it enough to. And I'll be able to use a pin card today. Uh, but yeah, I thought, but school was fun. I mean, it was lucky my school journey. I got to go to, did my, un, my undergraduate at Memorial and then went a few years later to do some graduate work at St. Mary's in Halifax, uh, which was a wonderful experience. And then I uh, went to London, which was excellent. Uh, same year, Tony Blair was elected in 1997. And I was at the London School of Economics and a lot of the people that had helped Blair win in Britain were there then so it was kind of neat 
as you were witnessing transformation at a leadership level mm. in the UK? Because that stuff interests me to be there and exposed to some of the people who, uh, who had been part of that exercise. So how did you chart that path then? <laughs> I mean, from, you, know, you talk about how you had a, uh, a, maybe this failed experiment at an Oakville boarding school to going to Munn, Mm-hmm. landing in Halifax, and then going to London School of Economics. So did you have a sense as you were in high school about where you wanted to go, or was this sort of a bit of a, as you were going along, you were building the plane as you flew it? Well, Chris, if you have Gen Z or millennial listeners, do not follow me, because I had <laughs> n- no super clear path, I think, until actually after Memorial. I'd, uh, I'd done pretty well with, with the rugby. I played on uh, an age grade national team for a couple of years the sport wasn't yet professional i was very fortunate to have parents who also always reinforced the the value of education and the like uh so i you know i kind of took a detour after memorial that i guess in the end wasn't a detour and through the powers of nepotism which is also a very Newfoundland thing, ended up working in Ottawa for a fellow by the name of John Crosby, who your older listeners will know, was a fairly significant cabinet minister in the Mulroney years, so learned at at his knee, and then when the progressive conservatives were defeated in the early 90s, went and worked in indigenous services of all places because I'd taken an interest in their history and their culture, particularly of the Innu of Labrador, And while I was working at Indigenous Services doing some negotiation work for them, I thought this was so fascinating what I was learning, which was about uh, the Inu people of Davis Inlet, Labrador, and at the time they were in pretty horrific conditions. I decided, oh, I know I need some more education. I enjoy what I've done here, so I I decided to go back to school um, and write, use, use my experiences to help get some degrees, but also tell the story of, of the, uh, the Inu of Davis Inlet. So what was your first Ottawa experience like? So you, you oh, it was the end of the Mulroney re- regime. It was fascinating. I mean, my mother, as she often does, gave me the best advice, and uh, many of your listeners, I'm sure, have gotten a version of that, which is, you know, uh, her version would be don't you know don't don't get too high on yourself and all of that. But was simplified by remember everybody puts their pants on the same way, one leg at a time, and that was as simple as it is. It was poignant, and so I always tried to stay reasonably grounded. But I remember God, uh, the things I remember from that early time. It was the so apartheid was ending in South Africa, and I remember. Uh, seeing Buta Lazy, the Zulu chief, re- just sitting in a restaurant in Ottawa, Solomon Rushdie uh, as well, before wow. all of the international threats were made against him. Yeah. Uh, you and I are, are sitting in a boardroom that's overlooking your old space at DND, but also the Westin. I remember one day going to the Westin. And Mikhail Gorbachev was in the elevator he'd been visiting, and he came right out and stood, and we were standing right in front of him, very short in real life. So all of these fascinating kind of experiences of just running into these historical figures, to me that was fascinating because that was what I enjoyed. Um, Very sort of funny to me anyway. Some people will get a kick out of it. when I was working with Mr. Crosby, one of the things he was working on at the time was foreign overfishing and a lot of the international law related to that. At one juncture, he uh, he went to Cuba and he met Fidel Castro. Now, I didn't go with him, but I intercepted him on the way back to get him from, I think, Toronto to St. John's. He was carrying with him six 40 ounces of bootleg Cuban (laughs) rum that Fidel Castro had given him. And here I am, you couldn't do it today, carrying that through on an Air Canada flight to St. John's with on pain of death if I broke one of the... uh, the bottles, and even more entertaining was one of my colleagues had traveled with him to Cuba to meet Fidel, and um, Fidel took a, an interest in this this colleague and would call our office in Ottawa, searching her out. So, Chris, it was a wild period, <laughs> the early '90s, of all these historical figures seeing human dimensions of them by accident. Was that your intention? Was to 
be involved in politics in some way, or how uh, did I that don't know. I, I, I again, kind of accidental tourist, and it became a, a fascinating experience. Um, again, at a young age, just more of the osmosis of it. You're a glorified fart catcher, uh, as, a, as as would be described. So you get to sit in and, and listen and learn. And I found it very fascinating. I like the both the impact aspect that politics could have and also the competitive nature of it. I think for me it was a nice um, extension of some of the things I'd been doing in, in sport. Um, and I was really lucky, like I was fortunate in an era to be with, you know, I suppose we all romanticize the past, but politicians who were, I would argue, more substantive and more engaged and had a broader history and life experience than perhaps some of today's political class do. Um, I guess he called me a snob and being elite, but um, I, I like people who had that bit of life experience. And I also got to see collegiality when the lights were off and the you know respect that was there. Some of that you rare to see today. So I liked all of the the substantive aspect of politics and and some of the personal aspect of it that I got to see when I was younger. Yeah, I. I echo that sentiment on the substantive nature. I mean, I've, I've had a, been fortunate to interview a, a couple of gentlemen who are from that uh, that era, and the thing that always strikes me about talking to them is their their depth of knowledge mm-hmm. and understanding on subjects, and uh, it's it gives you a sense of calm and confidence that even if you don't agree with somebody's political stripe, that uh, that they, it's informed. They mm-hmm. have an informed opinion. They've thought about it deeply, uh, and and that for me, at least, I can then look at that and say, well, I may see this differently, but at least I know you're not going to drive the the country off a cliff because you've you've got this sort of depth of knowledge and experience. And for me, that's quite comforting. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think like anything. Well, and I think what was interesting then, while there was degrees of professionalization in politics in that era was kind of the begin to the, the end of the old era, not quite the beginning of the new one. And by that, I mean the professionalization of um, political marketing tactics and the like. I mean, there were aspects of that, but not like it exists today with as it permeates through social media and tra- schools, training schools of, of political, uh, how, how to run campaigns and political professionalization didn't exist to the same degree that it did then. So you had more human elements and less mechanical elements or ingrained mechanics that people had learned through professionalization of their occupation. So what did you go to take at Dow when you were here in Indigenous Services? Dow, not Dow. Come on, I went to St. Mary's. That's oh, a crime. Sorry. Chris is now going to donate for that era $100. To I, could just, I can just edit this out. No, this no, 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 no. <laughs> we'll keep. I, I, um, I went and did something. It was a program I found called Atlantic Canada Studies. Really helpful, transferable skills, but it was interesting <laughs> to me. So, uh, so that's what I did. I did a master's in uh, Atlantic Canada Studies. Um, and I was really lucky there. Again, I had some great um, instructors, uh, Therese Arsenault. Some may know her. She for very, She's in New Zealand now, but she was a long-time academic in Nova Scotia and done a lot on, on party politics and proportional representation. And Dr. John Reed, Dr. Colin Howell. Uh, I mean, I would say, Chris, if there's a common theme of my haphazardness, I've haphazardly encountered good mentors and good leaders and I I know you focus a lot on leadership in in your podcast and I can't overstate uh, the importance of the right mentors and and finding them and learning from them Uh, and I was so I've been blessed in that regard and that was true at St. Mary's it was true when I was here in Ottawa with John Crosby uh, it was true when I first came to SUMA, where we're talking today, mm. because former defense minister, another Atlantic Canadian, uh, Doug Young, uh, was was here. He founded the company. Uh, he, he would be a mentor as well. So I've been very lucky in all parts of my professional journey to have that gift. 
Did you seek mentors out? So if you're talking about St. Mary's here and you've just uh, you know, listed a number of people, you just get lucky to be in these classes? Or did you actually, at what point did you say, you know what, I really need to find people who can help make me better? Um, it was a bit of happenstance, right? Yes, in some cases I luck into it and, and in others, but I think it was what I was choosing. I, I would know, like, so the Atlantic Canada Studies is a bit obscure, but the people that were involved in it were, were good people. And I, I had colleagues and other mentor, Mark Davis, when I worked at Indigenous Affairs, who became a very good friend, is a very good friend, who was a professor and he, uh, at Mount Allison, uh, which is where near our, where I was working, and uh, he he knew these people and he spoke well of them. So I guess a little bit of direction and a little bit of experimentation. Okay, what did you do after St. Mary's then? Uh, then I went. I kept going. I went on the school <laughs> bender. I, then I went. I said, you know what, shag it. I like it. I'm going to do another degree. I became a professional. So I went to the London School of Economics. Uh, for a year, I wasn't as I didn't have one particular mentor there, but the experience was, as I say, informative. I, I arrived just after Diana died, and Britain was in a bit yeah. of an identity crisis at the time, and Tony Blair had just become prime minister, and all of that so well documented in Helen Mirren's film, yeah, the, the Queen, the yeah. Queen, uh, and I, it was just a fascinating time to. To be in Europe, I think, I, I don't know which writer said it, but a, a year in London is worth a lifetime, um, and it's true, mm. uh, because of everything that is there. And I mean, you could walk the halls of the London School of Economics any day of the week and find a fascinating speaker or an interesting subject, and I'd had some family that had gone there. And I think the reason I chose the London School of Economics was I admired the people that were there, that I knew who had gone there. I mean, Crosby had gone there. Pierre Trudeau had gone there. Um, it was, a, I guess, I had a little bit of political thinking in it, and that it would never hurt. And the exposure to just all sorts of, I think there were people from 20-plus different countries in, in my just small graduate cohort, which was awesome. Because, again, uh, as I'm sure many of you know and your listeners know, you learn so much more about people and places when you're put into a place where there are different people with different views. So do you have an objective going there of saying, okay, when I'm done here, this uh, is yeah, what's next? Yeah, and, uh, well, I guess the objective was it wouldn't hurt me. And if I ever had an interest in politics... Um, then that would, you know, an LSE degree isn't a terrible thing to have. And it was and it was also useful for professional just development and opportunities in other places. It, 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 in, in those days, Jesus, we sound old, but it was, about, it was or I sound old, it was about the networking potential that it created and just the intellectual adventure was awesome. Mm. So what happened after London? Uh, came home and lived with mom and dad for six months. Actually, that's true. Before before the affordability cri uh, crisis of In today. In Newfoundland? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Went from, I, I came back and uh, was home for six, seven months and then went to work for another political titan in a dying party. I went... Uh, in 90, I came back in uh, late summer of 98, and then in February of 99, I came to Ottawa again, so that would be my second tour, and ended up working for Joe Clark, who had oh, come yeah. back to lead the PCs. So, what the hell, you know, you like a challenge. This was after Mr. Charest had left and gone back to Quebec to become the Liberal leader there and eventual Premier. Mr. Clark was trying to keep the PCs relevant, and... And uh, I worked there for about a year with him. A lovely man. We didn't always see eye to eye, and, um, but he, he's, a, you know, he's made a significant contribution to Canada. It's hard not to respect him. Just turned 85, too. So I'm curious. So you might say I'm, you can't keep a job, eh? <laughs> I'm curious as to so your, your family. I mean, is, so is your family predominantly conservative? <laughs> <laughs> They're predominantly <laughs> Newfoundlanders and Labradorians, which means we're um, kind of in the center. So when John Crosby was a liberal, of which he was. So I didn't know that. Yeah, okay. he was a liberal in the Joey Smallwood government, the first premier, okay. uh, the last, then the last father of confederation. Uh, and he broke up with Smallwood over some significant policy differences. So the whole family was liberal for a while and then moved to the PC side. But I think by nature we're probably more 
progressive conservative, and I think that comes from where we are, fiscally conservative but socially progressive. I think may sound antiquated to some, but reflective of, of our part of the world mm. uh, and upbringing. You know, a lot of heavy old-school religious uh, overtones, not just from Catholicism, but uh, Anglicanism and Protestantism, where you Weber and all of that help people and become engaged in society. So, yeah, I guess flirtation with liberal the Liberal Party and then been mostly conservative all the way along. Was there ever a pull to, because I think you've predominantly worked on, on that side of the aisle, was uh, there ever a pull to, or a reason you thought that maybe I'll have a look at another party or? Well, I kind of changed my view over the years. I hate partisanship to a large yeah. degree. Even then, I, I like people and I like to look for good leaders. And I have friends who are leading different organizations where would be identified as wearing a red jersey. And I don't necessarily publicly cheerlead for them, but I certainly support them in other ways and, and help they do hope they do well. But I like I think we're at a stage in our life where or I'm at a stage in our, our life, and I think our country's at a stage in our life where, you know, partisanship's important, but it can't be the prime motivating factor. Now you've you've had a pretty I mean you've had a pretty diverse political career, but you have you actually ever run? No. So I'm under threat of death. <laughs> my uh, my my mother said she'd kill me, and uh, I, look, I've had opportunities. Uh, people have kindly encouraged me to do it, but I don't know. It just never was the right time, and I've been fortunate to have a some good fortune in the business world. So. And now I have an eight-year-old and uh, soon turning nine. So I think uh, your dad, you know this, um, that's the most important job. Mm -hmm. And right now, any notion of politics takes uh, uh, not even a backseat. It's parked in a warehouse somewhere on, for a while and maybe parked there forever. Right. I mean, one of the things, that, actually, the, the thing that I brought you down to Royal Military College years ago to talk about was you know, different ways of leading in different organizations, and, and maybe we'll get to that later. Um, but I'm wondering what your first sort of foray was into the business world. So you know, <laughs> sort of talked about your your political roots, whether it be family or your first sort of jobs here in Ottawa. But when did you sort of, and why did you get into the sort of business side of things, the corporate world? Well, I was, I, you know, I, I, uh, I guess I could say some of the business started when I was a doorman. Uh, I was a bouncer for a while, which was kind of fun. And, you know, Chris, it wouldn't be beyond me to somebody gave me a 10 or 20 spot. I might let them in. So that was a little bit of an early, early commerce. Of course, I wouldn't break any fire safety codes. That would no, be against no, the law. But um, well, my dad was a, was an entrepreneur. He built a very uh, you know, successful construction business, uh, an offshore oil transport business. He was a developer. And so I guess I was watching him and seeing his intermingling between politics and business. He was, a, as they would describe them in the day, bagman for Brian Mulroney and John Crosby. And I saw in Newfoundland that there's a very tight connection between politics and business. So, so what does that mean, sorry, a bagman for... Collect, in the old days when you raise money, before all these rules and laws, you would go around and solicit money for a political party, and he was pretty good at that. You didn't trade favors or anything like that. That was, But you would you know, encourage people to donate if they wanted to see some policy change and the like. Hmm. You might give him a bottle of rum every now and then. <laughs> for, from Fidel's stash, <laughs> <Yeah>. Cuba? <laughs> uh, Joy Smallwood's hidden stash then. But So, yeah, so bagmen were fundraisers is a okay. more polite... 21st century, millennially appropriate way of <laughs> describing it. So I'd seen all of that. I guess my first foray into business, other than uh, I'd, I'd done a little bit of consulting in between um, finishing at the London School of Economics and, um, and coming to SUMA, but it was when I had the opportunity to come to SUMA, which is a consulting firm lobbying government relations. Uh, then that's where I, I think I, again, was mentored well by Doug Young and Paul Zed, who was here at the time, and, and Ken Whiting, and saw the ability to put some of the political skills I had to work um, while still keeping a finger in politics, but helping corporations and organizations figure out politics. And then after about, what, five years here at SUMA, four years at SUMA, the opportunity to 
buy into this business happened and that led to buying in or, or, or getting involved in other businesses that were of interest. So there was a, a latitude uh, and a degree of success that provided those opportunities. Now, when you got involved with SUMA, did you continue to maintain um, work in the political sphere? Well, as long as you could. All of that rules and laws have changed now, as you as you know, with all of the uh, rules that if you're in the lobbying business, as SUMA is a government relations firm, we're in it, you have certain restrictions as to what you can now do. But yeah, I uh, certainly was involved in different campaigns and while it was legal to do so and still certainly obviously my gums flap for a living now and I share opinions whether they're good bad or indifferent or anybody listens who the hell knows but so yes I was involved but the involvement changed as rules changed uh, in Canada around all of that and how did uh, maybe circling back to uh, rugby for a minute because I, I want to get to the, the the leadership question, but sure. how did you get involved in uh, in Rugby Canada, and how did you end up as the, the head of Rugby Canada? Well, they were desperate. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so we at SUMA had been advising a number of sports organizations. Rugby was among them, and uh, I developed a good rapport with the then CEO, Graham Brown, and he said, you know, you should consider coming on the board. And I said, oh, that sounds interesting because I started playing rugby again and, uh, and was loving that whole experience. And uh, the sport had given me so much. I think a lot of what I've learned about teams, about um, diversity of view, about perseverance, a lot of that came from rugby, other sports too, but principally rugby. So the opportunity came to join the board and uh, through the, the then CEO, and I, I joined it. And about three or four years later, four, three, um, the opportunity became to become, excuse me, I probably need to go back to grammar school, to become the chairperson uh, came to the fore, and uh, I was selected by my peers to be the, to be the chairperson and served in that role uh, for five years through COVID, which was fascinating mm -hmm. as sports were shutting down around the world. And it was uh, uh, tough, but exceptionally fulfilling. And like any organization that um, has national and international reach, it has different stakeholders, different pressure points. Um, it's a results-based organization because you're running teams that are doing uh, competing on the global stage. So that brings all kinds of different challenges as well. And we were transitioning and on other side. So yeah, it was, it was an amazing experience. Um, and uh, very grateful that I had it. And what did you, what's the difference for you in whether it be leading on the political side, leading on the corporate side, or leading in something like Rugby Canada? Uh, I, uh, well, I think the the, uh, let me start with the commonalities. I think you need, wherever you are, to know your audience. Like, who is your audience? Who are your stakeholders? Who are you actually working with or speaking to and in, engaging? Um, because if you assume that every audience is generic, you're going to get yourself in trouble. Um, and then I think you need to spend some time getting to know as best you can aspects of your audience and your stakeholders so you can communicate with them. I was very influenced by um, a course I did oh, in the mid in 1999 actually at, at Harvard. I was, when I was with Joe Clark, I went down there and did a three-week course at Harvard University uh, on business and government. And there was a section that I will always remember about persuasion. And I forget the, the academic, uh, but the persuasion theory was effectively know your audience, frame for a common ground. So where, where are you all together? Where do you find together? Uh, connect emotionally and provide vivid evidence. And that's always stuck with me because I think those four things are applicable in just about any leadership setting. So the, the, I'm wrapping that together. And I think, again, 
expectations what are the expectations of each organization that you have where is it in its lifespan what are, what are you trying to do how do you bring those people together and then how do you speak to that and how do you deliver that and how do you do it in a way that maintains your credibility because the other part of that formula is establishing credibility leaders can't succeed if they don't have credibility I think that's some of it is given to you, but in this day and age, more of it is is achieved. Uh, so, how do you build it, and how do you transact off of it? Yeah, leader credibility is a is a big one. I was I was listening to the the latest real time with Bill Maher, and he had I think his first guest on was to get this right, John Fetterman, who's mm -hmm. uh, from Pennsylvania. I think he's the I don't know if he's a senator or a congressperson from Pennsylvania, and Bill's sort of opening remark was, you you talk like politicians talk who have retired and now have the sort <laughs> of the, now have the locks taken off them, right? Um, but he's, he's a serving politician. Uh, and, you know, I'm curious as to what that leader, what you've seen in terms of a leadership evolution, and we've kind of tilted at a little bit in politics because my sense has, has always been that I would imagine the most of the electorate be very happy with people who are just honest, admitting mistakes, and moving forward, but that doesn't seem to be the rules of the of the game. No, because, look, we own a polling company, as you know, too, Abacus Data, which was part and parcel of the exercise of being at SUMA, and what, what we see in, in data as well, people... What hap What we see is parties, at least federally, cater to a specific segment of society because it, it's almost like the low LCD, the lowest common denominator. And that's not to insult people who are listening or to insult people generally, but the lowest common denominator is a, is a math uh, is a, is a mathematical figure, and that's about 32 percent of the electorate. Because as current um, electoral victories have demonstrated you can win a government in Canada when you win about 32% of the population. So as in other years, and this is where professionalization of politics has changed things, in other years where you might have you know, grand visions and politicians who actually are working to I mean, maybe try to get 60 to 70% of the poli political, um, uh, political support in the country, you now have a very a limited focus on a very specific target. And when you do that, your approach changes, which you address changes, how you hold on to power changes, because you're not looking to win big national arguments or inform national discussions. You're looking to win a third of the electorate, mm -hmm. a third of the electorate. And while it's important that the minority has a view, I think that diminishes politics to a, a, a large degree particularly on bigger, tougher issues. And, and again, I would say where the professionalization of politics has changed the game is you can target anywhere, anytime, just about that 32 33% that you want. And that rewards precision, sometimes brutality, in terms of creating a contrast. Um, it, it it plays to an instant kind of gratification of action, and it can be about harvesting a uh, a mood of negativity to suit your purposes, as opposed to the hard work of leadership, which is often solving problems, not reinforcing them. Um, so I think those are some of the challenges. And thing, look, there's always been aspects. Uh, of, of division and partisanship, but I think we're, we spend more time harvesting division than we do uh, trying to address the challenges of the day. You, you only need to look at the debates now around climate change. Mm -hmm. uh, carbon tax or no carbon tax. And that's about one specific instrument, right? It's been diminished to that point. Um, and everybody's to blame for that. Do you think there's any space for, uh, I mean, I'll just call it authentic leadership. That might not be the right word, but you think there's a space for that in Canadian politics? I, I, I would hope there is. Uh, you know, I, I look back, look, I, leaders that I think were authentic and they come from different parties, like Jean Chrétien harvested an authenticity. Um, 
and some of that was a caricature of the little boy from Shawinigan. Well, right. but he played up those Shawinigan roots, and if you've ever encountered him in person, he's a he's, 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 he's there's authenticity that uh, radiates from Ralph Klein, the late former premier right. of Alberta. Of Alberta, you know, who the, in both cases had some significant, mis- you know, Cretchen strangles a guy on Flag Day, and. Uh, comes back well from it, you know. Mm-hmm. A, a Klein struggling with alcoholism goes into a, uh, a homeless shelter and throws money around and comes out and apologizes, and people like him because they they sensed he was legit. He wasn't um, uh, from, I, I don't even know, can you say central casting anymore? Nobody will know what that means. <laughs> he wasn't a meme. How about that? There I used that go. expression a couple of times recently. <laughs> Yeah, it wasn't a meme. So I think there's a place for authenticity. I see people who are authentic seem to connect better and get a better respect. But there's more um, destruction of uh, attempts at destruction of people in the political world than there was before. More personal, I think. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Are you still on the board for the Center for Addiction and Mental Health? No, I, I'm not, unfortunately. But that's uh, I, I was, and that was very important to me. I very mental health and wellness is an issue that's gripped our family like many families um i myself uh struggled and i guess still technically struggle from depression so that was part and parcel of of giving back i had a grandfather who struggled with mental health and wellness and other members of the family so that was some time i really enjoyed unfortunately just um trying to raise a son and work and do all of that i couldn't do all the board service i wanted at that time I read your uh, I read your op-ed in the uh, was it the Hill Times or in the Hill. Uh, you know, th- thought you got to get better things to do. I you know, <laughs> but thank you, thank you. Uh, th- yeah, I could definitely say that there's probably things I could spend <laughs> spend my time doing uh, would be more valuable. But that was definitely in the valuable category. Um, that, so, at what point did you realize that you were you were struggling with depression? And I. I mean, not to give it away because, I mean, you share with the, the listeners, but, um, I mean, the support of your family was was really uh, was really critical mm. in, in you being able to deal with that in my reading of it. So, like, at what point did the sort of penny drop and you went, oof? Um, probably in the latter part... <laughs> I, I, no, uh, I guess it started to show itself in my undergraduate years at Memorial, and then when I, before I went back to school and I was working in Indigenous affairs after spending time here, but I, like many people in the time, like binge drinking was big, and we'd also had you know family history of binge drinking, so I was a bad binge drinker at university, but nobody thought anything of it. And then I would get what I would describe as booze blues, be very depressed afterwards because obviously your serotonin is depleted. And I kind of thought, oh, that was a, we all kind of thought, oh, that's probably just a reflection of, you know, university life and that'll straighten itself out. And then was fine here for the most part. The heavy drinking kind of continued, which it tended to in politics then, and then went to... New Brunswick and was working at Indigenous Fairs then and I just burned out. I just, one day we went on a family trip actually to Florida and I was just lifeless. With your your folks? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And they said we should probably get you some help and that's when, so that'd be 94, 95 that I get diagnosed and recognized that yeah, it's more than just alcoholism. I mean, I didn't have, I was lucky, I didn't have suicidal ideation or anything of that, but I was really just in a dark, cloudy place, as um, Churchill rightly wrote himself, a depressive, that's the only thing I would compare myself to Winston Churchill on, um, you know, the black dogs, and he talked about the black dogs of depression and how you're just in a your mindset changes, your your ne- your negativity, you feel helpless, and while well, the whole world might say, you shouldn't feel that way, you do, and um, I was really lucky again to have a, a good family doctor in New Brunswick, and then I also was fortunate that I was able, 
because of my mother and my father and the support I had there to get some first class mental uh, health care from uh, in Newfoundland. And ironically, I, my first time I went to see the psychiatrist in Newfoundland, I went to the same floor uh, in the hospital where my grandfather, like, decade before had been getting shock treatment and we ran into the nurse who had helped do the shock treatment with them. It was like, wow. Shock treatment a decade before. Yeah. So in the eighties they were doing shock treatment. Yeah. Yeah. I did. Thankfully I never had any of that. Pharmacology was, was making, you know, their uh, antidepressants were, uh, had been, had become more effective and I was able to utilize that. So, yeah. And then I've always tried to be very open about, my struggles because I know a lot of people have them and I know for me in the mid 90s when this was happening I was very lucky to have friends who also I could talk to about it and you weren't it was kind of that transition time where it was okay to start talking about mental illness and people weren't immediately castigating you or or shunning you and I again I'm very much encouraged by my parents and my mother in particular, like just be who you are, deal with it. It's good. And, and, uh, and that's been something I've tried to help others with when I can. Yeah. It's, I mean, people may have started talking about it. It was still pretty early days yep. talking about mental health. So, uh, that's well, and you guys in the military have gone through it too, right? Nobody would talk about PTSD or any of these things. And I'm sure you have seen the horrors of that, uh, met it out on friends and, and, and people you've commanded. And uh, so I've always viewed talking about whatever it is and trying to, I don't know if I afford it credibility, but uh, I'm not afraid to talk about it. Not And people should do whatever they think is best for them. But for me, I thought, you know what, if I can lead a little bit, I wasn't thinking about it leading. I'm just like, if it helps one other person, then that's good. How have you seen... Have you seen the acceptance of it evolve? Because you've got this really broad perspective across a whole bunch of mm. different facets of society, sports, politics, the corporate sector. I mean, has it been uniformly sort of progressing or have you seen it been sort of a little bit uh, fits and starts? Um, I think it's progressed. There's still challenges, obviously. But I think, look, a mental health awareness and the the treatment at, a treatment options have increased, though they're still quite uh, underserved, as many aspects of healthcare are. But you know, uh, I, the best example I can give is, I think, just about our company's an example of that. Most businesses now, if they're of a certain size, have employee assistance programs. That didn't exist when I was going through this. And what is an EAP? It's a uh, the ability to have at least an introduction or connection to somebody who, if you need it and you want it, who has some proper mental health and wellness training. So that's positive. The discussion has been positive. Um, I know we spend a lot more time in sport. Safe sport is a classic example of that. It's not just keeping kids safe from predators. It's also about how you talk to them, how you engage with them, the language of leadership has changed, whereas you and I may have grown up in an era where it was very much command and control and, you know, Mm. uh, a lot more passive-aggressive negativity, Um, there's more learning that's been done and teaching that continues to happen on how you motivate and guide, uh, and that's been influenced, I think, by mental health and wellness, too. Instead of diminishing and saying, you know, you're fat, you're lazy, you're slow, which, um, trust me, was said to me often in a different time when you thought it was all right, right. you know, to motivate you. Now you, you take a different approach. And I, I, that, that, I think, comes from what we've learned about mental health and wellness. How do you see in the corporate world the sort of trying to balance these things of, and, and it becomes, I, I find it does, and the military is really bad at this too, so maybe I'll just sort of, Use that my experience in the military mm-hmm. as an example is that I, I, I've often had conversations in my career or e- even since with uh, people asking about balance, and I, I sort of, I try not to laugh, but I say you know it's there's no really there's no such thing as balance about choices, 
Right. So if you're expecting an organization to provide you balance, it's unlikely to do so from a military perspective, right? Um, it's really about the choices you make to establish mm -hmm. how much work you've got, how much time you have for other things. Uh, now, I don't have a lot of experience in the corporate world, but I'm wondering how that balances when you've got, you're running an organization that has a bottom line that you, you need to make a profit um, and trying to take care of employees in the way that you sort of mm -hmm. describe with an EAP, but at the same time balancing with that, that out with saying, hey, you've got responsibilities, you need to still deliver this. Um, and I'm wondering if in, in the corporate world that that's, that's something that can be realized and still make a profit. Yes, I think it can, but you, you, got, you have to have, an, um, there's dual responsibilities. An employer has to be clear and transparent about what it is they expect from their employees and it ha uh, an employee and needs to create an environment for both the company and the employee to succeed. The employee has to understand there are outcomes and performances that are required as well. So like m anything in leadership, it's a lot about communication and good communication at the outset. It's also the type of employees you look for. Not everybody's the same, and that's fine. But, you know, uh, the term used to be self-starting. But we, we like a lot of the employees that perform well in, a, in our corporate environment tend to have, uh, you know, they have a natural inquisitiveness. They're not, a, they're, they embrace problem solving. Um, they're not afraid to ask questions, and we encourage all of that. And it, it goes back to what I was told when I first joined by the guy who ran the military, Doug Young, when he was defense minister, and then he came over here. He said, you know, I, I don't look at the clock. Um, you get your job done in the manner in which it's supposed to be done on time for the people that are paying, and that's fine with us. And we've kind of taken that attitude here. I mean, now there are complications that have come with COVID sure. and remote work and the like, um, but there's always complications in business or in any organization, whether it was a pandemic or something else, it'll change the way people work, but you have to be connected with the people. And they also have to buy in, and, and again, it's that credibility thing, or people being credible in their, their communication. And you also you know, have to offer feedback is a whole different thing. When you and I <laughs> were younger, you know, feedback was not a thing you would get. Maybe you got a little bit more of it in the military, or you knew if you were doing well because your promotion went through. But, yeah, feedback was you were lucky to have a goddamn job, and you come to work every day. We've had to learn a little bit more about giving feedback while at the same time still trying to nurture and encourage a bit of self-reliance. Mm -hmm. um, but, yeah, it's never it, – it, that's why I like business, because there's always, even in the management of a business, there's problem solving. How do you motivate people today? It still makes it fun to, to come to work. How do you get them to do it? For a long time, um, you know, compensation was that. If you pay people well, now while compensation still matters today, you look at holiday packages, titles. Oh, my God. Titles, titles, titles. Really? Kids like titles. And you know what? Fair enough. I don't sure. care. Sure. That's call, actually quite easy. Yeah, that that's the easy part, right? Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. Um, so I'm a bit all over the place there, but there's many factors in that. No, it's 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 good. I mean, you you asked me a question on on your show about you know leading leading a younger generation, um, and in fact, I had been asked that by a, a reporter when I was at Royal Military College about, wow, this is just a problem with this generation. I went, That's, no, 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 stop, stop, stop. It's really not at all. And your point about um, expectations of communication is, is I found, is actually absolutely key. Um, the buy-in thing you just mentioned, I think, is is interesting because I my sense is that the buy-in it doesn't matter how old you are um, getting people to buy in and I don't know if this is a post-COVID thing if this is a digital world thing um, you know what it is but 
is that are you do you find that that's a challenge is getting finding those people who will buy in before you hire them like at being able to identify yeah that? we go through a lengthy process here so there are five partners in this suma company and all five of them will do separate uh, sit downs with potential employees at, at a certain level mm. um, but we go through a fairly I guess, rigorous process because we want to know because it's about fit, right? We're a small to medium sized business, probably not unlike again, what you might do with a, a particular elite unit in a, in, in, in the military, you want a special, you're looking for a fit because you're, you come together in a team environment to do things and everybody has a role. So do you have the right fit? I think a lot of that for me and, you know, a lot, it's four of the five partners here all have some sort of sport leadership background. And the oh, okay. fifth is a big sports aficionado and fan. So we're always kind of taking the coach general manager approach right. to a team. How does this person fit? Do they work well here? And I think that helps us. I mean, like every business, we, we have turnover, but we've been lucky that we've had less turnover and people staying longer. And I think that's because we invest in the front end on the fit side of it. And if you have the luxury to do that, that's a good thing. Because if you get the fit right, your chances of success and however you may measure that are better, I think. Mm. How did your, how did your view of the world or how did your actual life change when you become a father? (laughs) Best thing ever happened to me. Um, I wasn't certainly on that path. It all came as a surprise, but I think it, it crystallized for, it, it brought me back to a place where I, of my childhood, where I was very lucky and fortunate and, and focused on family, community, shared goals. And not that I wasn't before, but um, with the birth of my son, Patrick, and being very involved in as much as I can in, in his life, coaching his hockey, doing all of that, it, you use the word balance. I don't know if it was balance or provided me a sense of purpose. I had mm. purpose before, but I think... Uh, again, you don't need to have a child to have purpose, but I think it changes the way you look at purpose and the way you look at things and the fulfillment and the worry and all the things that come with the responsibility of caring for somebody else. So, yeah, I can say without a doubt, I have wonderful experiences in my life, but the best thing that ever happened to me was the birth of Patrick and the life we have together. And he's sports mad, by the way. He's doing five sports and go. rugby now, too. <laughs> So did it change your, your lens on the world? Yeah, I think it made me more patient because, as you know, racing, <laughs> you learn to acquire patience if you didn't have it. Yeah. I think it also helps r- r- force you to reexamine your values and your priorities. And it also just, for me, it grounded me. So by values and priorities, it's like, yeah, I want to, you know, it's important for me to be a good role model for my fa- for my son. And maybe I didn't think of it in that way before. It's important for me to be a good teacher for my son, to make sure that he is as equipped as I was by the good parents that I have to go into the world. It's important to be, because I a little bit more public facing, to, you know, use whatever public facing engagement I have to be effective in being responsible about whatever the issue is that I'm, I'm talking about. So I, um, uh, yeah, I, it, it changed those things uh, for certain. And it's important to be present. I think that's the, you know, you count yourself lucky. I haven't played with my BlackBerry the whole time because you, you helped me be I, I present to our BlackBerry. Now I is said, it actually dated. a BlackBerry? No, no, it's a Samsung. <laughs> I should, if I was playing for it, I could make some money, I guess, off of it. But present, this whole notion of presence, I think I've learned more about that with and through him. Yeah, it's not easy. No. It's not easy. Uh, you have to be, I, I, I had to be, <clears throat> excuse me. I mean, I had to be very deliberate in doing so, so much so that I, I realized that I needed to retire from the military to actually set the conditions to spend more time with my, my daughter before she, she headed off to university. Um, because I knew that those conditions that I was in were, were not, if I wanted to deliver sort of excellence professionally, 
whatever was left over was not going to be sufficient mm-hmm. to be able to deliver excellence as a, as a father. And I said, well, what, one of these is going to have to change mm-hmm. and it's not going to be uh, being, well, one of them is going to change to allow the other one to change for, a be- for the better. So, uh, so how do you manage that? Because you've got... Well, it's interesting, right? Suma, though, I be, the yeah. radio show, you've got, a, you've got a bunch of stuff. Well, though I may not be as organized as a former general I'm looking at, <laughs> I'm pretty well organized. And I also have a bit more latitude. I think the, there's, a, there's detriments to becoming a father uh, in your 40s, as I did. Um, but the benefit, perhaps, is you're a little bit more financially stable. Mm. You're a little bit more stable professionally and or you have teams underneath you uh so i'm i'm lucky like i i in suma there are five people who help run the business in you know the other businesses that i'm involved in there's not one person so it doesn't all come back to me and and parts of it don't i've put myself in different positions of leadership where excuse me i play different roles now uh, so I, I'm, I'm fortunate that I can arrange the chessboard, to use that metaphor, to work for the time with Patrick, because it all goes so fast. It oh, yeah. all goes so fast, and it's the most important thing. I mean, if I'd have been in my 30s uh, when I had Patrick, it'd probably be more difficult to control some of the things that I had, but I would have found a way. Now it's a little bit more fortunate so the good fortunes at the front end the uh, you know I'll, I'll miss some things in his life because I'm a bit of an older dad unless I live to be 110 maybe I will so we'll see yeah it's they are such critical years I mean there's there's no doubt at a certain point you know the the influence of his friends yeah really really take over but you're in this beautiful spot right now where like he likes me still and I, he wants me to coach his teams <laughs> and I love that because I used to coach all the time so for me there's you know the benefit for me other than all the time with my son is I'm back coaching I used to coach rugby and we did well with that I used to coach a little did I coach soccer anyway did a lot of coaching so I'm back doing that I'm learning new skills mm. I'm learning and I like that so I'm growing and benefiting from the experience of having my son in different ways than I thought I would. And that's, uh, that's awesome. Right. And there's things that are transferable there that I can bring professionally because I'm dealing with parents and many of them are millennials or Gen Z's. So I'm learning how to communicate with them. And so it's helpful. I've always found that I, I try to apply myself in a way that it isn't just a linear thing. Like how can this benefit me and my learning and me as a dad or me as a leader or whatever in other circumstances? Not to be too, uh, too hyperbolic, but you know, what, what keeps you up at night? Um, and I say this from the sort of perspective of, you know, where the country's at, where the country's going, you know, you've got a young son, mm-hmm. you've got all this experience and, uh, and you've, you've seen the arc of, of especially political arc, but you've seen this from a number of different perspectives. I mean, what, what are the sort of things that keep you up at night? Well, when I'm not being reviewed by the Canadian Revenue Agency, uh, <laughs> love you, CRA. If you're listening, please, please, I'm sorry if I've ever done anything bad and all my things are legit. Um, what keeps me up at night? I worry, look, I guess it's natural as a parent, you worry about your son's future. I worry about what kind of world he's coming in. And while I still have energy, enthusiasm, and the ability to work, I want to make sure that world is, you know, as safe and as vibrant as it can be. I mean, I look, I, you know, I, is the world more unsafe than it was in the mid early 30s uh, maybe worry about that the instability there I worry about the planet like you know and I live in a region that's had floods and fires and so I worry about all of that I worry about his future but I, I guess the thing that balances that out for me is I still believe in resiliency and the ability of humans to work through their problems in a manner that can provide a mostly positive outcome. So those are the things I worry about. I worry about you know making sure everybody stays healthy and well within my own family unit. I worry about making sure my son gets the right you know by the right experiences. I mean he has interesting experiences that build curiosity, mm-hmm. that build that aren't you know limited uh, to rinks and, and and fields. Although those are great experiences for him. So those are the things I worry about. 
Yeah, I mean, one of the things that I'm, I'm trying to do with this podcast um, is to educate and inspire Canadians to sort of fulfill their their responsibilities as citizens. And your Robert Baden Powell quote is a fantastic one. It, it is, yeah, it's 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 great. Um, but someone who's in uh, who's a professional communicator and you know, talking about advocates and having all the the data. If you picked an issue, doesn't matter what the issue is, we could take things that are going on right now with foreign interference, mm-hmm. you could take climate change, you could take uh, NATO 2%, whatever yep. it is. How, how, do you, how do you get a busy Canadian that has got you know, kids, responsibilities, all of these things to understand or to be more interested in some of these bigger issues? Uh, or maybe, maybe I'm... I'm. Maybe I don't understand that Canadians actually are interested in this. Maybe you can dissuade me of that that notion. But my sense is that most Canadians um, are not particularly interested in some of these bigger issues. Um, and I'm just curious as to your thoughts on if there's a way to to get them a little bit more involved in things. Well, I think it starts with the communities that you're in, right? So I spend a lot of time in sports communities right now, and I'm really lucky to uh, to have that opportunity. I almost spoke some good Newfoundland and Labrador for you there, Chris. Um, but Don't save it just for the radio show. No, no, no. I'll, uh, well, i got to save some of the performative stuff. Um, I think it's maximizing whatever community you're in to make that community as best and effective as you can. So I look at this. The, for me, that influence right now, I try to met that out in sport, whether it be as a coach, whether it be as a parent and volunteer, because you're spending a lot of time with people, uh, with groups of people, and you're talking about different things. So... You know, you look at your immediate responsibility. If you've got, as I did this year, 11 kids and 11 families, you don't want to come with a political agenda, but you want to come with an agenda of what do you want to accomplish here other than actually at games. You want people to leave thinking that was positive. Why was it positive? Um, Oh, we all committed to a project. And this project was having these kids have a good experience, learn, you know, about uh, how to behave, learn about competition in a responsible way, learn about getting along with each other. And I think you take bits and pieces of that, and then somebody goes and brings that to another community. I think if you focus on fixing the big issues when people are busy, that's not as effective as using the communities you're in and making a difference in a community. There's a great quote that I once um, used and read off. I used it in a speech, and I read it often. It's Ralph Waldo Emerson, author of, you know, On Walden Pond. And he said uh, in, in this, to make life better, success, sorry, he, it's the verse on success. Success is to make one life better. And I think if you strive, make one life better, or make a marginal difference in one person's life, that has a domino effect. That will lead to other engagements. So great example, linking the sport together. Last summer, my son was very involved in in soccer. He's involved in soccer and four other sports this year, which is awesome. Um, We had three games canceled because of the smoke from the fires. Right. So a lot of parents had conversations about why is this happening? How is it happening? How do we make a difference? There's an example of, all right, well, I'm not, you know, I would not be known as an environmental NGO uh, activist, but... How does that conversation that had a direct impact on their kids change the behavior? How do you help it change the behavior uh, among a certain group? So you find ways to link what you're doing with bigger problems mm. that are there, but start with the community you're in. Yeah. Oh, that, that definitely makes a lot of sense. Um, you know, speaking of the, the sort of the, the community you're in professionally and We've got a lot of political things that are going to be happening in the next uh, in the next year or so, whether it be you know south of the border um, or 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 here things that we're dealing with at the moment. You know, potential people are obviously anticipating an election mm-hmm. for the the fall of 2025. I mean, do you get a sense through whether it be through abacus or just your 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 daily work um, about? The, the level of faith in you know our our political system and you know what do you think needs to happen if that's not where it needs to be for to to increase and get more on the positive side than negative. Uh, 
And if I've if I've sort of made any statements there that are no 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 right no, out, no 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 please let me know. It's a good question without a simple answer. Look, I think ultimately it's up to us, right? We decide, we elect, we choose to run or not run ourselves. And there's lots of disincentives to that now, whether it be the threats of violence that exist. You only need look at any media space, social or otherwise, or mainstream, and you see the challenges that are there. So uh, I, 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 I think it's about it, finding and encouraging different people to try and get into the arena and changing the way things work in the arena for better rather than worse, but that's a long slog. I mean, it's kind of embarrassing that, you know, the, that the United States could potentially be led by a convicted felon. Um, and that's not a, a, a condemnation because Donald Trump's Republican. I mean, even Joe Biden, Joe Biden in 20, 30 years ago would be a fearsome force. He's, he's aging out, not to be ageist, but it's, I mean, politics has become so much about the LCD again, the lowest common denominator, and I think it's up to us to try and change it. I don't know the easy ways to change it, but I know that we got to focus on trying to have better leadership and better governance and and trying to diffuse some of the anger that's there in society. But, you know, so much of politics now is about harvesting anger, not letting it out. I, I don't know. I, that's the sad part. I don't have a, an easy answer for it. Would you encourage, uh, well, let's just, let's take uh, something really personal. Would you encourage your son to get into politics if that was something that he was interested in? If he was interested in it, yeah. I mean, there's all kinds of ways to get into politics. You know, if he wanted to run for office, uh, you know, be a while before that would happen. I, I have a nephew who's very keen in, in the political journey, and he's doing it what I think is the right way. He's going and, you know, learning and getting education. And he's involving himself in different activities. I like. I, I think the model, the model I would encourage is do and try and meet different people, and you know, don't just just fall into one line of thinking. I don't think that helps anybody. You should have your core beliefs and values, but you should test them, and you should learn why other people think the way they do and and be able to communicate with them, and I don't think we encourage that enough. I think that's an educational system thing, too. Yeah, I, I, I think that's a really important point about our ability to listen. I mean, my... Listening, my, yeah. Yeah, my sense is that we've very much... It's become... Almost uh, people to get an allergic reaction if they bump into somebody who has a different opinion or if they're from a different political stripe. And, and I sh very much share your view on this that um, I, I don't align myself to, to any political party. I mean, if you want to talk about an issue, I'll tell you my opinion. And mm -hmm. um, I'm quite happy to be convinced otherwise that I, I don't know enough about this or I'll, I'll change, change my opinion. And uh, it, it seems to be the everybody's just got themselves so entrenched. I mean, I was listening to, uh, again, to Bill, Bill Maher talking about the figure the U.S. election will come down to three states. Yeah, I've heard that theory too. Three yeah. states. That, that to me is, uh, is, a little bit, uh, is a little bit frightening. Um, well, good leaders, though, I think you hit on a very key point. Good leaders are good listeners, too. It's not, again, I go back to command and control. It's not the... Uh, to use the military reference, uh, you know, you jump out of the trance and as we hit, you know, our big Beaumont Hamill anniversary in Newfoundland and Labrador, you don't just jump out of the trench and you needed to in those days, day and age, but now you, you listen, you hear, you think. It's just not ordering somebody to do something. A good leader needs to understand before they give an order, before they give a direction so that that order will be fulfilled and and, and the outcome will be positive, but listening is so important as a leadership trait. Tim, I really want to thank you for your time today, for hosting me here at SUMA, and, uh, and for everything you've done in terms of whether it be Rugby Canada, whether it be mental health, uh, these are all really important, and the fact that you've led and continue to lead across so many different domains here in Canada is, uh, I think, what makes you one of our Northern Sentinels. So thank you very much. Well, it's kind of you to say, and you keep up the good work you're doing, Chris. You're doing important stuff, and thank you for having me on. I hope you enjoyed my conversation with Tim Powers. 
please take a minute to subscribe to The Greater Good on Substack to get this and other content to help you citizen better. Thanks for listening, and goodbye until next time. Thank you.